I've had the new Nikon 35mm 1.4 with me for about a week now and during this time I've tested it thoroughly and compared it with the older, less fast but more expensive 35mm 1.8s. And I'm pretty confused but also quite impressed. But let's get started, I'm David, you are watching The Vision and let's go. If you enjoyed the video, remember to like, subscribe and hit the bell and feel free to check out my Instagram as well. Fast 35mm lenses are my absolute favorite prime lenses, which is why I was initially so excited about Canon's 35 1.4, only to be quite disappointed with the performance at the given price. Nikon's 35 1.4 is quite different. With a price of only 730 euros, it doesn't set the bar nearly as high as Canon. The price is even lower than the 870 euros that Nikon wants for its own 35mm 1.8s. But this lens is part of Nikon's S line, which marks higher quality lenses. The 35 1.4 doesn't have such a designation, but at first glance, the inclined buyer might still think that the 35 1.4 is of a higher quality and better than the one with just aperture of 1.8. Aside from the price, both lenses are very, very similar. There's only about a millimeter difference in length and diameter separating these two lenses. And the filter thread remains at the same 62 millimeters. The 1.4 is about 45 grams heavier through, but not heavy at all with just over 400 grams. Both have top-notch build quality. The 1.8 has a metal housing and metal focus ring, while the 1.4 is made of plastic, but that doesn't feel less of high quality. In fact, I consider the plastic focus ring an advantage since the paint of the 1.8 can wear off, as you see here with this model. What the 1.4 unfortunately lacks is a switch between AF and MF, which is a bit annoying, but unlike the 1.8, it has a customizable function ring. I really appreciate that even this extremely affordable 35 1.4 lens has a sealed design, making it resistant to splashes and dust. But remember, a lens is only sealed with a front filter. The 1.8 is also sealed, but it's part of the S series and you wouldn't expect to get a cheap lens with dust and splash resistance for Canon for example, except in their L line. Optically, both lenses have 11 elements in 9 groups and 9 rounded aperture blades. So nothing super complex and no gimmicks with the aperture. The reproduction scale is also very, very similar for both lenses. With a minimum focusing distance of 25cm for the 1.8 and 27cm for the 1.4. You won't get impressive semi-macro shots out of these lenses, but the shallow depth of field is very pleasant. But let's see how these lenses perform and wherever there's any justification for the 1.8 now. And not just for the 1.4, but we will see. And when it comes to sharpness, it becomes clear why this lens is so cheap. At f1.4 it's anything but sharp. It's really, really soft, really blurry, even in the center. It has a retro lens feel and doesn't look good next to the 1.8 version. Okay, the 35 1.8 isn't perfect either, especially at the corner sharpness, but it's much better than the 1.4. To achieve similar sharpness in the center and at the edges, you have to stop down the 1.4 version to f2.8. The 1.8 version also improves significantly in edge sharpness when stopped down to 2.8, but both lenses remain similar in the center at this point. The pore sharpness isn't just visible in my test subject shots but in almost every portrait I've taken with this lens. And of course, these were only taken with the standard 24 megapixel of the ZX3, not with pixel shift like the test shots. Even in other test shots I've taken, it's considerably noticeable that below f2.0 there isn't anything sharp with this lens. But there are other factors for evaluating a lens, like chromatic aberrations. The 35 1.8s has several elements in its design to counteract this. The 1.4 doesn't. But looking at my branches against the sky test shots, I see little to no lateral CAs. The color edges on contrast borders are very well corrected, but Lightroom also tells me Nikon has applied a built-in correction profile in the RAW files. I don't mind this because it doesn't affect the image quality. What also stands out in the images are the color fringing in the foreground and background blur also known as longitudinal CAs or LOCA. 
There are plenty of these with both lenses. And in my opinion, even more at the 1.8 lens. You can also see how much sharper the 1.8 is here. However, it could also be that the general blurriness of the 1.4 conceals the loca in this situation. Both aren't great at all. But at least with the 35 1.4, you get rid of the loca by stopping, stopping down to like say f2.8. With the 35 1.8 S, there's still noticeable loca at 2.8. I also subjected both lenses to a brief coma test. And if astrophotography is a concern for you, you are much better off with the 35 1.8. The 1.4 struggles significantly with coma, where point light sources outside of the image center becomes comet shaped. That's why we call it coma. But when it comes to bokeh, it's a completely different story. The bokeh of the 35 1.4 is far superior than the one of the 1.8S version. The 1.8S struggles with somewhat messy bokeh circuits. No onion rings, but restless texture in the bokeh circuits. The 1.4 doesn't have this. The bokeh circles are super clear, clean, neat and exactly what I would expect from a modern 35 1.4. Unlike what Canon calls bokeh in their 35 1.4 VCM. And there are no cat's eyes at all outside of the image circle, which is impressively good and completely different from the 1.8 S and also from the Canon 35 1.4 VCM, what is much more expensive. In practice, both lenses have a very pleasing, nice background out of focus performance. I took the 35 1.8S on vacation to Portugal and took many family photos and I find it very, very pleasant and calm and has a nice bokeh in practice. The 35 1.4 in practice has a lot of charm in the bokeh. Then it's not so clean, yes, it has more of a retro lens vibe, like with the sharpness, which I don't find bad at all in this case. It has a special look. You can call it somewhat restless, especially in the tra transition from sharp to blurred areas, although there isn't really any sharp area here at f1.4. But at least this lens doesn't cost 2000 euros. So what's the matter here? It's nice. When it comes to distortion, you can again see where the costs were cut. The 35 1.4 has a built-in correction profile that cannot be disabled in Lightroom, but there are other ways to see it and there's a quite significant distortion, which shouldn't be necessary for a 35 mm prime lens, but we also have seen exactly this in a 2000 euros Canon lens. The 35 1.8 S on the other hand is almost distortion free. Thanks to the built-in profile, you won't see any distortion, even shooting raw video with the Nikon 35 1.4 S lens. Because unlike Canon, Nikon bakes the distortion correction file directly into the N raw container. But I still don't like this digital trickery of image manipulation, so you have no distortion. Vignetting, at the other hand, isn't corrected by a profile. And here, the 1.4 performs significantly better than the 1.8S. At f1.8, you get almost black corners. Even though no distortion correction is needed here, which might crop the corners out. But that's without any correction, and it's nearly black. The 1.4 is much more pleasant in terms of, this, of the vignetting offers a notable but attractive vignetting that would probably look really, really nice in wide open aperture portrait shots. What I was really curious about, how good will be the backlit, the flare performance, the ghosting performance with this cheap lens. And in this case, the 1.8S has a nano texture coating on the lenses to prevent flares, to prevent ghosting, to give a better backlit performance. But in my tests, it was worse. Not maybe in terms of ghostings. It's okay, they both show some ghosting with the light source directly in the frame. That's not out of the world, it's not very unpleasant, it doesn't look as bad as with the Canon lens mentioned. But flares are a different story. For flares, I also tested it with my usual flashlight test and the flaring of the 1.8S looks really, really much, much worse than the flares you get out of the 1.4 lenses when you shine the light source from the side into the lens. 
And that was really strange since I thought the nano texture coating was to prevent such things. But the cheaper lens is better in this case. But buff lenses are very, very good when it comes to sun stars. Buff produce exceptionally well looking sun stars with the nine rounded aperture plates and I really, really like the sun stars coming out of these lenses. Now we need to talk about the autofocus. First of all, it's nice that the lens doesn't rattle, which is worth mentioning these days, I think. However, the autofocus speed of the 1.4 is, for me, probably the biggest weakness of the lens. Focusing from one point to another point in a other distance takes noticeably longer with the 1.4. Something I haven't experienced with any other Nikon lens before, not even with a cheap Wiltrox lens, which I think focuses faster than the new 35 1.4. This means the 1.4 is might struggle to keep up with faster moving subject in front of it. So it might be not suitable with its limitations for playing children, for sports or for dog portraits, everything that moves fast. Maybe the autofocus is not fast enough for this. The 35 1.8 S is significantly faster in terms of autofocus tracking speed and following the subject. It's quicker and so you are less likely to encounter issues when you are shooting faster moving subjects. You can barely hear the autofocus of the 1.4. Maybe if you hold your ear against the lens, you can hear it, but not in practice. In contrast, you don't hear anything from the 1.8 S and that's one of the biggest differentiators between the two lenses. What is also very important for me with 35mm lens is the video use. I shoot all of my talking head here in the studio with a 35mm lens and I've already filmed a few videos with the 35mm 1.4 and now it's also filming. For video, the autofocus isn't a problem at all since you want smooth focus transitions even with autofocus. And a lens that focuses a bit slower than another isn't a problem at all for video. And you don't hear the autofocus of the 1.4 during video either, because it's acting slower and then you don't hear it as much. Nikon advertised the lens as being focus breathing free. But unfortunately that's not true. The lens clearly shows focus breathing. I would say it's very, very well controlled and nice. And in practice, it's not a problem at all with this lens, but you can see it. And if you can see it, it's not focus briefing free. Incidentally, the 1.8S shows the same amount of completely acceptable focus briefing. So for video use, you have a good choice with both of them. In the end, the Nikon 35 1.4 is by no means an exceptionally good lens that can be recommended without any reservations. It has it, its optical limitations, yeah, especially regarding the sharp lens. If you want a sharp lens wide open, it's not for you. However, there are also some points where it outperforms the more expensive and slower 1.8S version. Both lenses are in practice a lot of fun to use. The 1.8 is cleaner. Some might say it's more sterile, while the 1.4 is more playful, has a bit of a retro feel and charm and some character to it, especially with the bokeh. Both lenses are very suitable for video and the 35 1.4 will often be attached to my Nikon Z6 III from now on, filming videos here in my studio for you. Absolute image sharpness isn't necessary for video and I really, really like the look. It's pretty much the kind of 35mm 1.4 I would have wished for from another manufacturer as well. But yeah, that's it. It's relatively affordable. It's small, it's compact, it has a decent performance. Not the best. It's quite good for video as well. It's not perfect, but for 730 euros, it doesn't have to be. That means I will keep it and I'm almost certainly most of you will enjoy it too for Nikon cameras. If you find the lens interesting and its features convincing, you find links to order the lens under the video in the video description down below. I will also link the 35 1.8 S there because when it comes to the best image sharpness in a 35 millimeter for Nikon, the, the 1.4 doesn't hold up. But the 1.8 S version isn't perfect either. You have to consider what you value more. But let me know how you would decide, 1.4 or 1.8 S. Feel free to write it in the comments down below under the video. And if you have enjoyed the video, 
leave a like under the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and hit the bell if you don't want to miss any other videos from me in the future. Here are two more videos that you can check out next and that's it from television for today and I have to say goodbye until next time.